Have you ever heard the expression, familiarity breeds contempt? Well, it means that if you do something a lot, you take it for granted. This can happen to people who work in and around trenches. Many of you have never seen one cave-in. Hopefully this is because the trenches where you worked were always properly protected. But maybe some of them weren't and still nothing happened. Maybe you or others went into unprotected trenches for just a few minutes without anything going wrong. Well, you've been lucky. Although you may have taken them for granted in the past, trenches do cave in. And when they do, the results are very often tragic. talk about how and why a trench caves in, protective systems, and other safety measures required when working around trenches. A trench is a narrow excavation whose depth is generally greater than its width. The width as measured at the bottom is 15 feet or less. Now to understand why a cave-in occurs and why it's so dangerous when it does, you need to know one basic thing. Soil is very heavy. This may not be news to you, but I'll bet it's heavier than you think. A cubic foot of soil can easily weigh more than 100 pounds, depending on the type of soil and its moisture content. And when a trench wall collapses, a lot more than a cubic foot of soil gives way. For example, if a six-foot-long, four-foot-wide section of an eight-foot-deep trench collapses, about ten tons of soil can fall on a person. With this kind of weight pressing down, anyone who is buried doesn't have a chance. They won't be able to expand their lungs to breathe, nor move their bodies to dig themselves out. They will die from suffocation if not rescued within a few minutes. And even if rescued, they will probably suffer serious internal injuries. And don't think that smaller trench collapses aren't dangerous. A person buried up to their chin, or even to their chest, can suffocate because they can't overcome the weight of the soil around them to breathe. And a person immobilized by an initial collapse can be helpless if the trench collapses further. Now, why do trenches collapse? During trenching operations, the weight of the soil adjacent to a trench pushes in a downward direction. But since soil is somewhat fluid in nature, the downward pressure leads to lateral pressure. Think of what happens when you push down on a pile of soil. Some of the force is directed downward, but some also causes the soil to spread out to the side. It's the same with trenches. The weight of the soil itself creates lateral forces that constantly push in on each side of a trench. These downward and lateral forces are resisted by the cohesiveness of the soil. Cohesiveness depends on the type of soil and its moisture content. Some moisture helps soil stay cohesive, but when soil dries out, it becomes much more susceptible to failure. Of course, when there is too much water in the soil, like after a rainstorm, a trench can collapse from the additional weight of the water. Other factors that affect the stability of a trench are its depth, freezing and thawing, vibration, and the weight of the spoil bank and nearby equipment. A trench can fail in several ways. The vertical face of a trench can deform from the weight above, start to bulge, and ultimately collapse. Or tension cracks can form, usually at a horizontal distance, one-half to three-quarters the depth of the trench. Sliding or toppling may occur as a result of tension cracks. And, of course, overhangs in improperly dug trenches can just collapse. Because the consequences of trench collapses are so severe, comprehensive safety regulations have been issued. These regulations are vigorously enforced and penalties for non-compliance are severe. Penalties are even more severe when an accident is involved. In addition, there have even been legal actions against individual managers when a trench collapse resulted in death. So think about it. It's not just the company that may be at risk if something goes wrong. 
Now that you know how cave-ins occur, let's look at the protective systems that can prevent them from happening. Protective systems are required to protect employees in trenches five feet or greater in depth, unless the trench is made entirely in stable rock. Even employees in trenches less than five feet deep require a protective system, unless a competent person determines there is no indication of a potential cave-in. Now, there are two types of systems that protect against cave-ins. Sloping or benching systems and support or shield systems. Various combinations of sloping, benching, shoring, or shielding are also used. The exact design and setup for any of these systems is not left to chance. The protective system must meet exacting regulatory specifications, or the manufacturer's or others approved tabulated data, or be specifically designed by a registered professional engineer. Since the regulations do not cover excavations greater than 20 feet deep, a shoring equipment manufacturer or a registered professional engineer should be contacted for these cases. The point is, selecting, setting up, and monitoring trench protective systems is not for amateurs. You have to know what you are doing. That's why the regulations give important responsibilities for safety on trenching jobs to people they call competent persons. A competent person is someone designated by the employer who has training, experience, and knowledge in soil analysis, the use of protective systems, and the requirements of the regulation. They must be able to detect conditions that could result in cave-ins, failures of protective systems, and hazardous atmospheres. One of their duties is to make an inspection daily, and after every rainstorm, to look for such conditions. A competent person must also have the authority to take prompt corrective action to eliminate hazards or stop work when required. Now, the purpose of this program is not to make you a competent person, but it's important that everyone who works around trenches be aware of the basic safety requirements. Your life can depend on it. We have already talked about when a protective system is required and the basic type. Let's go into more detail on their design and setup. Sloping or benching systems protect employees from cave-ins by forming sides that are inclined away from the bottom of the trench. The maximum allowable slope of the side varies with differences in the soil type, its properties, performance characteristics, and environmental conditions. For purposes of designing trench protective systems, the regulations define four soil types. These are stable rock and types A, B, and C. As we mentioned, stable rock does not require a protective system at all. It can be excavated with vertical sides and remain intact while exposed. Oftentimes, drilling or blasting is used for this type of excavation, and the competent person must be certain that as a result, it does not become fissured or cracked or otherwise unstable. Type A soils are the most stable you'll generally encounter. Type A soils are cohesive soils with an unconfined compressive strength of 1.5 tons per square foot or greater. Examples are often clay, clay loam, or cemented soils such as caliche or hard pan. No soil is type A, however, if it is fissured, subject to vibration of any type, or has previously been disturbed. Sloping or benching for trenches in type A soil must be at least at an angle of three quarters horizontal to one vertical. For example, a trench that is eight feet deep and six feet wide at the bottom would have to be sloped like this, resulting in a trench 18 feet wide at the top. Type B soils are less stable than type A. They include cohesive soils with an unconfined compressive strength greater than one half ton per square foot, but less than one and one half ton per square foot. Other examples of type B soils are angular gravel, silt, unstable dry rock, and sandy loam. Type B soils also include those that meet the unconfined compressive strength requirements for type A, but are fissured or subject to vibration. Trenches in type B soils can be sloped to an angle of one horizontal to one vertical, or 45 degrees. Type B cohesive soils may also be benched at a 45 degree angle. Type C soils are the least stable. 
They include cohesive soils with an unconfined compressive strength of 0.5 tons per square foot or less. Other type C soils are granular soils such as gravel, sand, and loamy sand. Submerged soil and soil from which water is freely seeping is also type C. Trenches in type C soils must be sloped to an angle of one and one half horizontal to one vertical or 34 degrees. Benching is not permitted in type C soils. Soil classification is one of the competent person's important responsibilities. When classifying soil, the competent person is required to make at least one visual and one manual analysis. Visual analysis is conducted to gather information about the site in general, the soil adjacent to the trench, the soil forming the sides of the trench, and the excavated material. Soil should be observed as it is excavated. Soil that remains in clumps is cohesive. Soil that breaks up easily is granular. Soil particle size should be estimated. Fine-grained material is more cohesive than coarse-grained material like sand or gravel. There are also a number of manual tests that are used to classify soil. A plasticity or thread test can be used to determine soil cohesiveness. Penetrometers are direct reading, spring-operated instruments used to estimate unconfined compressive strength in clay or cohesive soils. The thumb penetration test involves an attempt to press the thumb firmly into an undisturbed soil sample, such as a large clump of soil. If the thumb makes an indentation in the soil only with great difficulty, the soil could qualify as type A. If the thumb penetrates no further than the length of the thumbnail, it is probably type B soil. If the thumb penetrates its full length, it is type C soil. But again, determination of soil type is not for amateurs. The test and soil classifications must only be done by a competent person. If no effort is made to classify the soil, it must be treated as type C, the most unstable. Also, it's important to look for cracks in walls, standing or seeping water, sources of vibration, and buildings or other structures which might require an engineer to design the protective system. Now, instead of sloping or benching the walls of the trench, shoring or shielding may be used. Shoring is the provision of a support system for trench faces used to prevent movement of soil, underground utilities, roadways, and foundations. The basic types of shoring used are timber or aluminum hydraulics, although pneumatic and screw jacks can also be used. The sizing and spacing requirements for timber shoring members are provided in detailed specifications. They vary based on the depth and width of the trench, the soil type, and the type of wood used. Manufactured shoring systems like aluminum hydraulic must meet the use, installation, and maintenance requirements of the manufacturer. In the absence of this data, specifications in the regulations must be used. It's important that when using hydraulic shoring, it is checked at least once per shift for leaking hoses and or cylinders, broken connections, cracked nipples, bent bases, and any other damaged or defective parts. Trench boxes or shields are different from shoring because instead of supporting the trench face, they are intended to provide a barrier in the event of a cave-in. Again, the manufacturer's use and installation instructions for trench boxes must be followed precisely. This includes the capacity of the trench to withstand a cave-in and methods in which boxes may be stacked and fastened together. Employees are never permitted in trench boxes while they're being raised or lowered. Any type of shoring or shielding should be installed and removed in a manner that protects employees from cave-ins, structural collapses, or from being struck by members of the support system. When using a trench box, the excavated area between the outside of the trench box and the face of the trench should be as small as possible to prevent lateral movement. It is generally recommended that this space be limited to six inches on each side. When digging the trench, Excavated materials or spoil must be placed no closer than two feet from the edge. This will help to protect employees from materials that may fall into the trench and to reduce any extra load on the walls. The weight and vibration from construction equipment can also add to the load on the walls, so avoid using heavy equipment right next to the trench. Now, besides the proper design and setup of protective systems, there are many other safety concerns when working around trenches. Let's go through them one at a time. 
Serious accidents and major disruptions of utility service have occurred because utility locations were not properly identified before digging took place. Utility companies or owners must be contacted and advised of the proposed work and asked to establish the estimated location of the utility installation prior to opening the excavation. Many states have 800 number call before you dig services to reach utility companies. There is no excuse for not making this call. Never dig unless you are certain what's below. Then when digging operations approach the estimated locations of underground installations, extreme care must be taken. Determine the exact location of the installation. Then work carefully around it, digging by hand if necessary. Be sure to provide support for the installation if needed. Workers must be able to leave a trench quickly in the event of an emergency. Trenches four feet deep or more are required to have safe means of exit, such as ladders. And there should be no more than 25 feet of lateral travel for any employee to the ladder or other exit. When installing ladders, make sure they extend a minimum of three feet above the surface to facilitate safe entry and exit. Employees exposed to vehicular traffic must wear warning vests or other suitable garments made of reflectorized or high visibility material. In addition, the work area itself must be suitably protected from oncoming traffic. It is possible for a hazardous atmosphere to occur in an excavation when working with chemicals or working near a sewer, landfill, toxic waste site, or marshy area. Hazardous atmospheres include those that are oxygen deficient, explosive, or are potentially toxic. When a hazardous atmosphere could reasonably be expected to exist, air monitoring, ventilation, respiratory protection, and emergency rescue equipment may be required. Walkways are required where employees are required or permitted to walk over trenches. Guardrails are required on these walkways where an employee could fall six feet or more. A plank is not good enough. No employee is permitted underneath loads handled by lifting or digging equipment. The control of water in a trench is very important. Employees are not permitted to work in excavations where there is accumulated water or where water is accumulating unless adequate precautions have been taken. If water is controlled by water removal equipment, the operation and the equipment must be monitored by the competent person. Remember, regulations set forth specific requirements for all protective systems, including sloping, benching, shoring, shielding, or any combination. Guesswork is not permitted. As you can see, there is a lot you need to know, and there is good reason for this. People die in trench accidents. We can all get complacent when we get used to doing something. Don't let this happen to you. Be smart and work safely around trenches. Remember, trench safety, it's more than digging a hole.